So welcome back. It's been a while since I've done anything fun. Got a lot of familiar crap going on lately, but I have been stockpiling some stuff to work on. And I just recently came back from a trip with this little guy. Uh, quite honestly, I walked into a junk store, saw a pile of stuff, and this was buried under it. Gave the guy 50 bucks for it because it looked okay, and yeah, I, uh, I've only done one television repair before my uh, RCA 9T246. That was a lot of work, but, you know, for in, you know, a 1949 set, you know, a lot of tubes, very heavy built RCA. This guy, on the other hand, is a General Electric 14T... Oh, shoot, I have the backboard here. 14T012. It says it's rated at 150 watts. Which isn't bad. Uh, anyway, this is from 1956. It is a 14-inch portable television. I just, I loved the, the two-tone paint scheme on the steel exterior. And it's light. It only weighs about 20, I think the ads say 25, 26 pounds. Which is pretty good. There's no power transformer in it. This is a completely heater, uh, series, heater-strung setup. And, uh, let's turn on the side here. I've already gone ahead and removed all the control knobs because I'm going to be getting the chassis pulled out of this to take a look at the condition. But we have these nice little baby blue knobs here for all of that. And one thing I liked about it is that all of this stuff here is stamped into the metal. Since a lot of the areas, the nicks and dents, paint missing in several spots, I'll wind up repainting it. But I don't have to worry about decals because everything is embossed. What will be tricky though is when I do the paint, I'll probably have to go in with a brush and add in all of this, because um, I'm not going to be able to mask it well enough. That being said, all that's off of there. Unfortunately, the tuning knob, channels 2 through 13 here, the center is broken out of it, but I should be able to glue that back together. Thankfully, it must have been kicked because it was on the floor. And the tuning is actually a two-part, so you have the wide base that slips on here for fine-tuning, and then this rather nifty uh, UHF channel selector knob here. Pretty cool. Anyway, swing it around the back. We'll see what we're working with here. I was really happy to find that this still has its original GE CRT in there. It's a 14QP4. That's, I think I'm missing a digit. Where's the, uh, the tube chart? on the uh, inside back of this guy here. Yeah, yeah, it's a 14 q 4 a uh, But anyway, yeah. So you can see we've got our tuner section down here. And then on the right we actually have, this contains I think a 1x4 uh, high voltage rectifier. We have our high voltage horizontal driver tube. I think that's the high voltage damper. And then we've got a cheater cord connection. And there's actually a toggle switch on the back here for local or long distance reception. Kind of interesting. UHF connections, this little plastic guy right here is our uh, horizontal hold. It says horizontal drive on there, but um, I'm pretty sure that's less. Well, I don't know. Let me check the side again. Yeah, because we only have a vertical control on the side there. So it looks like your uh, your horizontal lock is actually on the back of the set. Oh well. And then there's also some stuff for, I think, uh, horizontal and vertical linearity. And then the... This is an electromagnetic set, so we've got one ion trap magnet. And then the yoke actually is clamped onto the neck here. In order to take the chassis out, we have to release the nuts. I've got the SAMS document on it to figure out how to do that. And then one little permanent magnet speaker, and the, the cone on that is in good shape. So, overall, for 50 bucks, I think I did pretty well. I have already brought this up on a Variac. No raster, unfortunately. Got nothing out of the uh, high voltage, no squealing. It didn't sound like it tried to kick on. But uh, all the tubes have, have filament continuity. They all glowed, including this guy. And I would like to take off the screen protector on the front, it's made out of plastic, and see if there are any indications of a uh, burn-in on the screen. 
because I don't have a, a CRT tester, so I don't know how much life this tube has in it, what the cutoff and everything is. Let me get that uh, in there a little better. This light's not perfect. Oh well. But yeah, it's a, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Well, the picture tube would be a 14 tube television. And the way you're supposed to uh, open this thing up, actually, is you take all the knobs off of it, take the cap off, disconnect the speaker, uh, to, uh, unclamp the yoke off the neck of the CRT, and then you shift the whole thing right. This is actually set up with two PCBs, one on the left and one on the right that are screwed to this, uh, it's galvanized actually from the look of things, the galvanized chassis there, and you're supposed to rock it out to the right so that the high voltage cage clears the edges of this because this is all riveted together and you're not going to get it apart. So, that is what I'm going to attempt, but I'm going to do that off camera, otherwise I'm going to be slinging things everywhere. So after probably 15 minutes of screwing around, I finally managed to get the chassis out of that thing. Um, although the, the instructions say to remove the chassis from around the picture tube, quite honestly, if I was going to do it again, I would recommend just taking the, the cover off the front of the box. The uh, deal there, just take the front off of that. It's like three screws. And then unhook everything from the back from the picture tube and just pull the picture tube out first. It's going to save you a lot of effort. Because in order to get this out, you actually have to remove the yoke assembly. Now on some of the older televisions, that would have been an enormous pain because usually the yoke is pretty well on the CRT neck. However, this one actually wasn't all that bad. It's just got this one clamp at the back with this plastic brake back here that holds on to the neck. And then, yeah, that's there are two resistors here. I'll check those. And this whole thing actually is actually attached to the speaker assembly with a little octal plug. So, very simple. Careful not to nick the extremely fine magnet wire holding the whole thing together. And then, of course, we've got the CRT socket. And this is actually fused. It's got a 2.5 uh, amp slow blow fuse on it, which is nice. But let's flip it around and see what we actually have to work with because it's pretty compact and there's a lot of friggin' dead spiders in it. Okay, so that is what we have to deal with. Honestly, it's not as bad as I thought it'd be being a, uh, a compact set. There is some rubber wire in here. The insulation's not cracking off, but not too great. The high voltage lead killed me. This is... Uh, our HT connection. It's just, yeah, that it's it just hooks inside. There's there's no cup. I'm used to having a suction cup that actually snaps into there. A uh, few things worthy of note. Uh, these are the two main electrolytic caps. This one, according to the schematic, is a 300 microfarad. And I think it's rated at like 150 volts or something for the um, the B plus. The B plus in this set is 130. And then there's a secondary B-plus of like 115 uh, off of a half-wave selenium diode rectifier here, which we need to see if that's any good. That, I'm guessing, is probably original equipment. And it looks like the vertical output transformer is a replacement. I did notice in the cabinet there, there's actually the end flap from a Miller Electronics box for a 4.5 megacycle coil. So I'm guessing one of either the video or audio IFs got replaced. And uh, there's not, no, there are some wax caps. So got one tucked under here, that guy, that guy, that guy. Ooh, that one's rated at 1600 volts. I don't have any like that. I don't do television work very often, but I've got a, <laughs> my little RCA oscilloscope's gonna need one or two of these too, so I'll have to put together an order on Mauser and get those in. And then this cap here, this is actually the rectification, or the, sorry, the, the um, this is a multi-cap. It's got three different ones in it. I think there's a 
like a 200 micro at 150 volts. There's also one in here that's rated at about 300, and I think it's like 60 micro or something. I'll have to deal with those. Uh, oh, my favorite. This style of wire connection here, it's a bit hard to see, where they simply wrap it around the uh, terminal. I don't really care for that. I'm sure at the time with the square edges and everything it cuts in there and makes a decent electrical connection. Philco liked to use that. And a lot of other people did too. You just have a, a, a point and then you have a wire wrap gun. Wire wrap is great, but over time that connection is probably going to oxidize and I'd prefer to solder it and just make it a little bit better. Although from what I understand from the aircraft industry, a lot of places prefer this attachment versus a solder joint because solder joints, if they vibrate, they actually work hard and it snap off. But I mean, when you're dealing with solid core wire like this, I mean, honestly, the same is going to be true whether you solder it or not. Either way, not important. We do have, let's see, it's a .05. The real trick is going to be removing and replacing them because the only way to get to all these components is to take those circuit boards out. Uh, which they are attached with self-tapping screws to this thing. Uh, oh, in order to get this chassis out, by the way, there are only three screws holding it in. The handle on top has one screw on, and then there are another pair of self-tappers at the bottom. And that's it. Once you pull the knobs off the outside and take those three out, it'll, it'll flop around on the inside. So pretty, pretty easy. So that, yeah, we've got the electrolyte filter caps. Our controls on the side here. This board, what is this made out of? It's just fibrous. This one control is a little little off kilter. I noticed I thought the knob was warped or something, but no, the actual piece of uh, the wafer they're attached to is warping. That's unfortunate. But, uh, yeah, that about covers it for this. I'll probably go ahead and uh, take it to work use the compressed air and just blow all the crap off it because it is a bit on the nasty side and there's, God, there's so many dead spiders on it. <laughs> uh, I did notice also some replacement tubes including one or two that <laughs> basically just said used or factory or guaranteed factory spare or something. Uh, the kind of thing you'd see for resold, you know, partially used tubes. So it's had a little bit of work done in the past, but nothing crazy. Yeah, it's it's going to take a little bit of cleaning. I would also like to see inside the high voltage cage, which I believe we can do fairly easily. It looks like the top is just clipped on. I do want to see, make sure the tube is in there. So yeah, we just need to... Uh, I feel like a pair of pliers might actually be better for this, but I don't have one handy. There we go. Let's see if there's anything living in there. Alright, we got a flyback transformer. Let's see if I can't make that a little more. Obvious. I really need something to rest this on. How oh, that'll work. Okay, so yeah, we have flyback in there, and then we also have our 1x4 rectifier. Flashlight. That doesn't look too bad in there. There is one power resistor, it looks like, on the socket for the flyback right here. We'll need to see if that's in tolerance, because I'd really hate to have to go digging around in there. But the flyback is interesting, is it's actually on a giant phenolic socket with the wiring all attached to the other side here, so you don't have to worry about like unpotting crap. And in fact, the uh, potting on the outside of the, the coil is in great shape. As opposed to my RCA, where it was all just, it was, it, it looked like a, one of those ba mini Baby Bell cheese wheels with the coating, and it was just falling apart. I don't see any real issues other than some junk in there. So I think we should be okay. 
Just though, out of curiosity. Gently, gently remove that cap and pull the rectifier tube without. If I can, I don't even think I can. God, they made the the wire on the uh, the cap is really, really short, like abysmally short. So there's, you can't really move it anywhere without risk of breaking it off. In fact, I don't think I can. Yeah. I can't really wiggle that out of there. There's not enough space. So we're just going to leave that in and assume it's okay. Once we get the horizontal oscillator running, if we start having problems with getting high voltage beyond that, then I'll start suspecting that too. But I don't generally see that one failing. So we'll just go ahead and close that back up. I did also notice a power resistor on the top of the chassis here. frame. That wire wound right there. I'm not quite sure what that, uh, oh, no, on the schematic, let's see, what is that, 63 ohms? 53 ohms. Yeah, I did see that on there. The power supply, I believe, relies on a pretty basic voltage drop resistor to uh, give the 115 volt DC supply from the 130 volt rectified. And then it has a single electrolytic uh, capacitor on there for filtering. So nothing, nothing too crazy. We'll probably need to replace the selenium rectifier with a modern silicon diode. So for that I'll need to figure out what the current draw through it is in order to get the proper voltage drop resistor installed in there. And then, yeah, we'll go on a uh, capacitor replacement safari. As much as I can get done, I probably need to put together an order. In fact, I'll know I need to put together an order for the electrolytics and some of these. But on the whole, I should be able to replace a fair few of them. And with the chassis out like this, I can probably just hook it back up to my power supply and see if I can't get the uh, horizontal section at least working and developing high voltage. Thankfully, with um, with this sort of a system, with the HT lead and all that, I don't need to worry about not having it hooked up to a load and then powering it up. It's it's not like a uh, an electrodynamic speaker where if you don't have a load hooked up to a power supply on an older, like late twenties radio, the the power supply can can go crazy and you can damage it. With these, you know, you're literally just applying a, uh, a you're just applying a static voltage. Uh, I think this is rated for eight point two kilovolts. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't have anything that'll register that much uh, that much voltage, but the easiest way to tell if one of these is actually running at all is, of course, the uh, classic high-pitched whine you get from the flyback running at uh, 15,750 kilohertz. Anyway, that's all for this one. I just wanted to get a look inside and see what I had to work with and see if there's any major damage, which... Doesn't appear to be, thankfully, or at least I haven't caused any yet. I don't know how I feel about this. This wiring is a little, a little stiff, but I'll get it cleaned out, brushed up, and then see about how hard it's going to be to take these circuit boards out. And I'm, ooh, seeing some heat around this socket right here. It's starting to discolor the phenolic. That's one of the downsides to using circuit boards with vacuum tube electronics. Is there's no way, good way to get heat dissipation without direct uh, contact with metal. These sockets are literally su um, suspended from their pin tabs. You can see it's solder points on the phenolic wafer. So that heat is just going to radiate out around here and blacken it. Now thankfully they don't have a power rectifier on uh, this board since they're using a selenium. So that's usually what I see on the later radios that have circuit boards, it's always like the power tubes and the rectifiers that generate the most heat and cause the most damage. Usually the socket first if it's not ceramic. These wafer sockets here do not do well to heat over time. They get brittle and they just crack apart. So after a little bit of work, we now have just about all of the paper capacitors dealt with, uh, except for this big one labeled buffer. I just got the replacement for that in, put an order at Mauser, so I'll be able to deal with it. But all in all, it wasn't too bad. Uh, I thought about filming the procedure, but it was 
kind of a three-handed operation. Effectively, once you take out the self-tapping screws that are located on these boards, this whole board will kind of fall out, and this whole board will kind of just fall out of it. So once I had them pulled forward enough, I could reach with my soldering iron the pads at the back of each capacitor, uh, soften them, and then pull them forward with uh, my forceps. So not too hard to get all them out. I went around probing at the resistors. The only thing that I have a problem with this setup is that identifying the resistors is pretty difficult because there are there are numbers on the boards themselves that they don't seem to correspond to the components in any way, shape, or form. I was really hoping that it would correlate to the schematic better, but it just really doesn't. However, I was able to identify the working groups. This section down here with this coil, this is our horizontal oscillator. And this big guy right here, the 1600 volt paper cap, is actually part of the vertical output circuit. This couples, I believe, to the uh, drive transformer. So that's important. And then this coil right here for the horizontal is a uh, air core, is it? No, I believe it's a, fer a ferrous core tuned with this plastic stick that comes out the back here. Can't see it, sorry. But that's our uh, horizontal hold adjustment. So now that I've got those in place, and you can actually take a look over here and see everything that we removed. Good selection of paper caps there. Not a ton. There were a few values I did not have, like right here, I think it was a 0.015. Uh, not a value I really keep. And I didn't have anything close enough to it. Or no, I think it was 0.15. And the next one up that I have is 0.25. And I wasn't going to jam that in there. So those all worked out well. I realized a little while ago, looking at this diode right here, this is not the original diode, obviously. And this power resistor, this 20 watt guy right here, is also non original. Someone's already beaten me to the punch and replaced the original selenium rectifier, so I don't have to worry about that. I checked the output voltage on this, and it is exactly what the uh, schematic refers to, about 134 volts DC at the first electrolytic here. <laughs> so that's good. We're going to leave that alone. Everything in there seems to be done pretty well. It's protected, so great. Also, here is our replacement for that. Good size. And I have a box elsewhere with all of the replacement electrolytics. But the next thing I want to deal with was the fact that when I fired it up, we didn't get anything out of the horizontal oscillator, no, that, none of that typical whine. Well, the reason for that was the one tube that I didn't bother cleaning up, the 12BQ6, which is the driver tube. The 7AU7 is our, our horizontal oscillator tube, and then this actually provides the high current drive for the output transform, uh, yeah, the output transformer. Well, when I pulled it out, because I noticed it wasn't glowing, uh, that right there, blown getter. The whole thing is gone to air. So this tube is crap, but the filament was still good enough to allow continuity, so all the other tubes lit up, drawing 300 milliamps or whatever. But this one, of course, didn't emit electrons. It wouldn't work, so we got nothing. I tried, briefly, a 6BQ6, which is the one you commonly find in transformer televisions, but the 6BQ6 has a 600 milliamp filament current, and since this heater string is only, uh, this, it's set up for 300 milliamps, the tube wasn't getting enough current to actually glow at normal operating voltage, and so I, I couldn't get anything out of that either, so I figured, oh god, there's something else wrong, didn't think about it, so I bought went ahead and bought a brand new 12BQ6, and we're going to go and see what we get now. Let me drop my voltmeter up here, and see what our high voltage is. This little finger sticking out here is actually for discharging the CRT, or, yeah, this is for grounding the AquaDAC coating on the CRT. So, let's see what happens, and snap that on. Let's see if we can get some crackle out of the speaker. Uh, hold on a second, something's not quite right. Oh, I haven't selected a scale. Excuse my reach. Let's try that again. 
sitting at 20. There we go. So I'm just going to bring this up to 100 volts right out of the gate since I haven't seen any leakage problems with the capacitors thus far. We're up to about 146 volts. The tubes haven't started conducting yet. That will drop once they start. Oh, shoot. Actually, no, they won't. It just occurred to me. This is a series filament string, and we don't have the CRT in circuit, so it will not do anything. Oops. That was dumb. Give me a moment. Okay, let's try that again. So I've got these two alligator clips here. Uh, the CRT socket. This particular picture tube uses pins 1 and 12 as the filament, which are right next to each other, conveniently. And they are actually uh, the red and black wires at the very bottom of the socket. The black wire goes over here to that pin and the red wire goes over into the vertical circuit just up here near this tube socket. Now, we should get that going. Bring it up to 80. And I've got the high tension lead out of the way of anything because I don't feel like getting hit with about 12,000 volts today. Our B plus is slowly dropping and the rate's picking up a little bit. That's good. And yeah, I can hear the horizontal oscillator kicking in. Yeah, 97. Gently bring this up. Uh, okay. Something's not quite right. I can hear the horizontal oscillator fluctuating. You know what? Ah, I think that's good enough. Something about having that connection dangling down there by itself is not too comforting. So. We know we have high voltage and all that other good stuff. So the next step, I believe, is going to be to replace these two cans with all my new components. Let me grab those real quick. Some of these, I believe, yeah, this is the 300. First cap is a 300 microfarad. I believe it was originally about 200 volts, no, 150. That can will get replaced by that. That is nice. And I have a ton of terminal strips, as it's going to take at least one for this thing and all the associated wiring that goes with it. Yeah, that's going to be... That's going to be fun to get rid of. Uh, one thing I will point out about these capacitors I am still learning about certain things like ripple voltages and such. I am uh, try to buy the ones that are high temperature rated, so they usually come in 85 degrees Celsius and 105 degrees Celsius varieties. And when I can, I always try to go for the 105 degree suckers, because once this thing is in there, it's just going to trap a lot of heat. Sure, there's a fair amount of metal of this chassis that should conduct to when all the tubes are up here, but still, it's in a box, and it's 
with the picture tube being right up against this area right here, all that heat is going to radiate out. So having components that can survive it is a good idea. Now, since I have all that set up, B plus has drained off. Go ahead and get this ready for a little bit of minor surgery. And then I'll have to figure out how to pull the CRT out of the cabinet so we can get it up here on the bench and I can slide it in, put the yoke back on it and the ion trap magnet and see if we can't get a raster. All right, I apologize for the impromptuness of this clip here, but I've got the picture tube mounted in the chassis as best I can to approximate what it should be sitting in there like the cabinet is. It's crammed. So we've got all our controls in place. CRT is sitting there nicely. You can see the horizontal is going. I've got power on. I might be able to see a bit of the glow. The CRT is definitely alive. And I'd have a signal source hooked up to it. And we have what I believe is vertical stability, uh, brightness. This is contrast and then power and volume. We just get a bunch of static right there. Like I was mentioning earlier, this is our uh, horizontal oscillator control. And then we also have um, height and vertical linearity back here. It's an interesting control scheme. But, most important thing, we have a raster. And there's still a decent amount. Let's see, that's maximum brightness. I'm trying to keep it a bit dim. And that's that's the vertical. Now right now I'm trying to feed a signal from uh, my Super Nintendo. I've never actually used the RF out and stupidly I don't have a Balin for this. Someone's messed with it before so it's kind of haphazard. But yes we do actually have a picture. Now the contrast, the control is dirty so we get some junk in there. However, I'm trying to see there might be something like uh, improperly tuned IF cans or something and the uh, signal is just not coming through, or the RF output on the Super Nintendo doesn't actually work anymore. I'm not entirely sure, and I don't currently have another RF converter with me to actually feed this a signal. However, I'm going to look at the schematics, see if I can't figure out maybe where the composite video signal passes through. If I'm lucky, I might actually be able to uh, bypass the RF section. But yeah, I am uh, <laughs> I am excited. But that's gonna be it for this first segment here. Eventually, we're gonna get on to stripping and painting that cabinet, pounding out all the dings in it. And, uh, oh shoot, you know, I forgot to show you my capacitor set up on this. Let me go ahead and turn that off there. And we'll take a quick peek down here. So this is originally where our two cans were, for reference. This is the main multi-section. It's got, uh... Let's see here. Yeah, that's been scratched pretty bad. It's got a 60 microfarad at 300 volts, a 200 microfarad at 150, and a 30 at 150. Now, this is actually for 85 degrees Celsius operation. Okay, well, I went a little overboard with the 105 degrees Celsius guys anyway. Uh, what I did in order to make room for these though is I drilled out the rivets holding the two clamps in place and ditched them. And the screw that actually holds the fuse block in place on the other side has a retaining nut just the right size for this terminal strip and then I put the capacitors in order so the 68 micro the 200 and then the 30 over there and splice the necessary wires to them they all have a common ground went back to that now what you can't see unfortunately is way in the back there the initial 300 microfarad capacitor is tied to the terminal strip that the person that put that diode in there and replaced the selenium kindly left me, which has a center negative post. That came in super handy. I was able to direct mount it. And with the CRT in here, I can see there's no problem with uh, it being too close. 
So that's good. So the next step I think for me is going to be uh, getting a proper signal source and then taking a look and seeing if there's anything that needs to be done with aligning the set. I've never done a television before. This is all FM after all. But I do have I do have a generator with a sweep function for uh, aligning TVs. I think it's 10.7 megahertz is the uh, alignment center frequency for this. But uh, yeah, I had a good amount of fun getting the ion trap magnet in the right place to get the picture because I had nothing when I started and it took a little bit of jiggling for it to finally kick in. So super happy with that, but I got reception problems to deal with. And uh, yeah, not a super clean setup, but good progress. Glad, I'm, glad the CRT wasn't a complete dud because I'm not sure looking around for another 14 QP4 would have been a lot of fun. Yeah. This is going to be awesome. Thanks for watching.